Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 Economic Democracy keynote. Uh, my name is Pavlina Cherneva. I teach economics at Bard College and I direct the Economic Democracy Initiative for the Open Society University Network. Um, Eddie's research, curricular programs, and community engagement are centered around a basic question. How do we bridge cutting edge economic thinking, data, macroeconomic policy to what are internationally recognized economic rights? These are the very basic essentials for a decent and dignified life, the right to a job, the right to housing, health care, income security, to name a few. And current economic policies which aim to eradicate economic insecurity but are not grounded in a framework of legally enforceable rights to these very basic necessities are bound to disappoint. Um, and the reason for this is because crises, pandemics, recessions, they concentrate the mind, they draw our attention to the problems of poverty, of uh, homelessness, inequality, of joblessness, but that attention very quickly wanes as soon as the economy recovers. And this produces an incoherent stop-go macroeconomic approach that never quite manages to address uh, economic insecurity or eradicate it all together. And this is not for lack of tools or means, we do have them. This is about policy orientation. And what we get from this policy failure is a global economy where the haves can weather any storm, but the have-nots are left with precarity, with instability, and with trauma. Um, the inevitable impact of this approach is rising global inequality, which is the topic of today's talk. So I am delighted today to introduce to you our guest and our keynote speaker, Professor Jayati Ghosh. Few people have shaped the global conversation on social, economic justice, public health justice, gender equity, like Professor Ghosh. For her work, um, she has been asked to advise governments in India and around the world uh, to consult international organizations such as the ILO, UNDP, UNCTAD, UN Women, um, and she's also a member of several um, <coughs> international boards and commissions including the UN High Level Advisory Board on Economic and Social Affairs, uh, the International Commission on the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. And last year, she was appointed to the World Health Organization Council on Economics, on the Economics of Health for All. Uh, this year, she was invited to um, the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. Professor Ghosh has taught for over 30 five years in uh, JNU University at New Delhi. She's currently a professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and is the author of more than 20 books and 200 journal articles. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ghosh. Thanks so much, Paulina, for that very generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm actually delighted to be associated with this initiative. I think it's really important. I think bringing back the notion of economic democracy as the reason we do economics at all, the reason why we're interested in policy, is absolutely crucial. And particularly, I am so uh, impressed that you are linking the idea of economic democracy so critically with rights. Uh, because it's, as, as you said, it's unlikely that we will ensure this without this being legally codified and required and incumbent upon states to deliver because otherwise, uh, if you like, the political forces and the power imbalances in our world are too strong for us to be able to confront them continuously and especially in the face of crises and, and various other kinds of upheavals. But also because we have to recognize that 
the reasons why we don't get the, the basic elements of economic democracy or the fulfillments of what we would consider the basic social and economic rights are very strongly related to those power imbalances. And those are reflected in the growing inequality that you mentioned. But in a sense, the inequality also causes that lack of the achievement of rights. And what I'm going to talk about today is, is more global, but it also reflects very much at national, subnational, and local levels in terms of those power imbalances. Uh, so I'm going to try and identify some of the big, some of the big picture sort of uh, circumstances of global inequality and then hone in on how those actually get reflected in the absence of the economic and social rights that we all want and in the absence, in fact, I would say the growing absence of economic democracy in many parts of the world and then finally maybe consider what we can do about them. Okay, so, um, let me see how we, okay, that's how we, how we go down. So just a bit of context first, which is to say that uh, this, uh, the pandemic has created very much a concept of what we would call you know, the before times and the after times, that the pandemic has changed everything and so on. Hey, it didn't actually. I mean, it changed a lot of things and it has given us this very peculiar period of two and a half years where all kinds of things have almost seemed in abeyance or, or, or uh, sort of just frozen in time. But we have to remember that capitalism globally was not in good shape even before the pandemic. Yeah? I mean, there were all kinds of uh, problems with it. We had slowing global growth. Uh, I can just show you that briefly over here. So over the past half century, actually, you're getting lower and lower rates of growth of global income, okay, GDP. So yes, overall, money incomes are growing, but an economic activity is growing, but if you look at the rates of growth, those are the orange, then broadly there is a general decline. Now you can say GDP is not the best indicator of human progress. I completely agree with you. I'm completely on the side of those who say we should not be measuring uh, progress in terms of GDP, monetary activity, and so on. But hey, that's what capitalism is all about. Capitalism is about growth. That's it's raison d'etre, that's the reason it exists, okay? And so if it's not doing well on growth, then capitalism in its own terms is not doing so well, okay? That's, that's the first point. Even the growth that we've observed since the global financial crisis, which uh, you were probably in school when it all happened, but since then, just keeping to those relatively moribund, relatively slow rates of growth has required massive injections of liquidity. Okay, unbelievable, 28 trillion, I think, is the amount that the central banks of advanced economies have released into the global economy, the 28 trillion dollars since 2009, which is not a small sum, shall we say, historically unprecedented, massive, massive injections, just to keep afloat, just to keep things going. Why is that? Really because, in a way, what we had in that period of neoliberalism that culminated, if you like, in that financial crisis, except that it didn't culminate, we still have it. But what we had in the two or three decades before that was this massive uh, context in which capitalism, or shall we say large capital, was too successful for its own good. Uh, what do I mean by that? So. Uh, in biology, you may have heard of this prey predator syndrome. And basically it means that if you are a prey, you need, uh, sorry, if you're a predator, you need to keep alive your prey, at least certain amounts of it. So you can't eat too much of your prey. If you keep eating up your prey, then you won't have more food. Eventually the predators will suffer if they overeat the prey. Okay, and it's a well-known biological sort of relationship, that, the, that you need to preserve certain amounts of your prey just to keep alive. Well, what did capitalism do? It kind of overate, or large capital overate. Large capital consumed everything that could inhibit its functionings in any way. And in doing so, it kind of, I won't say killed the golden goose, but it certainly reduced its ability to, uh, to feed on the system. 
Why? Because it destroyed the regulatory power of states, which enabled states to provide some limits and you know, preserve some rights of citizens and of others in the system. It destroyed the bargaining power of workers. Globalization, the entry of massive you know, workers into global labor market from the developing world, China, India, elsewhere, etc., reduces the bargaining power of workers, enables capital to demand worse and worse conditions of work, lower and lower wa wages, larger and larger shares of the value added in economies everywhere. So we see you know, wage shares of global income going down in every country in the world. Uh, and it basically re reduced the welfare measures that were provided to citizens. The welfare states that were established in much of the advanced world in the post-war period all got eroded less and less social protection of even the most basic kinds was offered across the world. Now, all of this meant what? It meant that people didn't have the money to buy the goods that capital could keep producing, or what is often called underconsumption. There wasn't enough consumption, and that was because you, I mean, you, you, you know, there's only so much that Elon Musk and Bill Gates, etc., can consume on their own, right? Even if they keep going to the moon every second day, it's still not enough to counter the declining consumption of billions of people across the world. So capitalism, in that sense, generated this lack of demand, okay? And so this was, yes, an outcome of these dramatically rising inequalities of incomes, of wealth, and of the falling shares of wage income that I've mentioned, but it turned out to create a problem. So these then meant you had to constantly think of new ways of generating demand. So why did we have a glo the global financial crisis, which begins, originates with that subprime crisis in the United States? Because you had to give, instead of work giving workers wages, you had to give them debt. You know, you, you were reducing their wage shares, so they were able to consume less, but you needed them to consume more. How do you make them consume more? By getting them into debt relationships, which simultaneously deliver more incomes for finance, okay? So all of this really meant that even before the pandemic, global capitalism was already, if you like, limping along, fed by these enormous, enormous um, uh, liquidity uh, uh, injections into the economy from the advanced central banks. And it also meant that global investment growth was extremely volatile. What I haven't added here, I didn't want to spend too much time on it, is that what's really interesting about this global investment, it's not just volatile. Most of it, believe it or not, in the last two decades has been public. In the major economies, this, the additional investment has been public investment, including in the United States and China. China, people will not be surprised because everyone knows China is supposedly you know, state-led economy and so on. But actually the share of public in total investment has been higher in the United States than in China in the last two decades. And it's so it, it isn't even private investors who have been keeping these economies afloat. And then in that context you get the pandemic, right? You get this COVID-19 shock. Now what I'm going to look not at the shock itself so much as the impact of it and the implications of it. But one of the extraordinary, I mean, it, of course it revealed lots of existing inequalities. We know that within countries, across countries, but it very starkly revealed this inequality in fiscal capacities, okay? So there are really, really sharp differences in the kinds of fiscal support that governments have provided since the COVID shock. The advanced economies went to town. Suddenly, all this talk about how there's no money, we can't do it, we can't afford to borrow more, went out of the window, right? Uh, everybody who had been telling you there's no way the budget can just expand on the basis of central bank money expansion, we can't do that. Suddenly, the money was there. So you have unbelievable expansion in terms of the, uh, okay, no, not this one, but this one, yeah. Look at the average increase in post-COVID fiscal support. This is just up to March 2021, okay? So between January 2020 and March 2021, the advanced economies on average are spending more than 22% of GDP, nearly a quarter of GDP additional fiscal stimulus. The United States, I think it's now 
with the latest, if the latest budget gets passed, it will be in the range of 35%. I mean, crazy numbers, right? Unthinkable numbers in the past. But they did it. Compare that to what the so-called emerging markets, the middle and, uh, you know, basically the low and middle income economies, um, I don't know what to call them anymore because, you know, everyone said emerging and developing countries. They're not emerging anymore. Many of them are not developing anymore. So let's stick with middle income and low income, I guess. Um, they were spending much less as a share of GDP. The low income countries were spending even less as a share of GDP. Now remember, their GDP is already lower. To give you one sense of what this means, my estimate uh, based on the IMF data is that the US between January uh, 2020 and March 2021 spent $25,000 per capita, okay, additionally. $25,000 per person additionally. The low income countries spent $2 per capita, $2, okay. That's the kind of difference we are talking about. Now, obviously, if that's the kind of difference, um, where are we? Yes. That's going to have huge implications in terms of how your economies respond. So if you look at the additional spending, the IMF estimate is around almost 11 trillion. I think it's 10.89 trillion or something. 80% of that additional spending is just 10 advanced economies. Together, they account for less than 12% of global population. Okay? More than half of that, 56% of that, was from the US alone. All that additional spending. Now, why didn't the others spend, you will ask? I mean, what was stopping them? If it is so easy to just put the money out of the hat, and it turns out it was easy, why couldn't the middle and low income countries do it? Because they have been part of that whole global globalization phase that I told you about, which was associated with lower investment rates. Part of that was that these middle and low income countries were increasingly integrated into global capital markets. And so while there is no good economic reason for governments not spending, there's a hell of a lot of reasons international finance will provide for why governments should not spend. So global capital markets are always looking at the fiscal deficit to GDP ratio, and they're always tapping governments on their shoulders and saying, hey, your fiscal deficit has reached 2%, 3%, 4%, any number, it doesn't matter, that's terrible, you better watch it, you have to cut spending, we don't like it, yeah? And finance ministers across the developing world, or whatever world, whatever world, yeah, the non-advanced economy world, are constantly looking over their shoulder at the credit rating agencies, at the, uh, you know, the financial journalists who will say, oh my goodness, that's an increase in the fiscal deficit, and they don't dare. So even when they, there are some countries, a very large number of countries actually, who already have sovereign debt concerns. They have very large external debts. They have problems of repayment. The pandemic dramatically increased those problems of repayment. But even countries that don't have those sovereign debt concerns, countries like Mexico, India, we didn't spend more. We, I mean, the Indian government increased its spending by 6%, okay? 6%, that's all. Inflation was 7%. So in real terms, the Indian government reduced its spending during the pandemic. Mexico, almost similar. I mean, it's slightly, in, uh, it's like 1% more than the rate of inflation. So really, they were fiscally austere during the worst possible time to be fiscally austere. And it was, it had immediate implications. It meant they couldn't do the basic social protection that in the US is taken for granted. You couldn't give, certainly you couldn't give, you know, the cash support, you couldn't give the child support, you couldn't do, you couldn't provide support for small and micro enterprises, you couldn't do anything, okay? You couldn't even spend more on health. Education, the Indian government spent less on education during the pandemic. When we have a massive digital divide in India, instead of spending more to ease that digital divide, they said everything's online now and you're on your own. So we're closing all the schools, so we don't need to spend more money. They actually cut the education budget. Uh, I mean, that's an extreme case, but you will find that across the rest of the world, there was really very, very little in terms of additional spending. Now, obviously, that immediately impacts on people's lives. 
but it also impacts on the macroeconomy. It means that you have therefore lower growth. You have less chance of recovery because if the government is not spending, now in the pandemic, nobody else is spending, right? I mean, everything is shut or closed and even when you do open up a little bit, investors are not going to come and spend. Households have lost livelihoods and incomes, they're not going to spend. The only agency in that economy that could increase spending is the government, it's public spending, and that didn't happen. So these are economies that haven't recovered in the same way. The recovery, again, it's focused and concentrated in the North and China. I'm leaving China out for many reasons because you know China is exceptional in all kinds of ways. So let's, let's leave China out of that discussion. We can come back to it if you have questions. But it really means that this is a, a condition the period of the pandemic was much, much worse for the rest of the world than for the rich countries in purely economic terms because of that hugely different fiscal response. And it means that they are even weaker now when things are not getting better. If you even say, well, we're beginning to come out of the pandemic and you know, less and less infections per day and all of that kind of thing, their economies have suffered such a hard hit and it's been reinforced by that lack of fiscal stimulus that it will take much, much longer to recover. And then now things are getting worse, right? Global financial conditions are worsening because inflation fears in the north and the tightening of monetary policy in the north already means that all those capital flows are going to be volatile anyway. Even if you've been very well behaved and not increased your fiscal deficit, you're still going to get bashed by global capital flows. The Ukraine war has not helped either by causing significant increases in food prices which, and fuel prices, both of which affect a lot of the rest of the world. And so basically now developing countries, the rest of the world once again caught in that pincer, which is not of their own making. At a time when everyone's saying, well now we can stop all those relief measures that the international system was providing to the rest of the world because now the pandemic's over, we don't need it anymore. So basically, here's the GDP change and you will see that the biggest declines uh, have happened and are likely to happen now in the developing world. I've already talked about the fiscal responses, so I'm, what's the right hand side of this chart? It's interesting because you know, what's, it's really interesting, we spent less additionally than we did after the global financial crisis, even though this had been a much bigger crisis. So it really tells you how much global financial markets have created all these unnecessary constraints on what developing countries do. But then there's the other aspect of global inequality expressed most starkly in what you could call the vaccine apartheid. Why vaccine apartheid? Well, because this is a, a very interesting pandemic. It's not that we haven't had epidemics in the past, right? We've had the H1N1 virus, we've had the Ebola virus, which was actually more fatal. The Ebola virus created greater fatality in the populations in which it occurred. But these are not viruses that hit the North very much. So because this one began by hitting the North more, you actually find much more concerted response of, shall we say, call it the international community, in terms of developing vaccines to counter it and so on. Massive subsidies provided by especially rich country governments to private pharma companies to develop vaccines. And in addition, some other vaccines being developed with state support in other countries, in Russia, China, India, uh, Cuba in particular. And, and so on. But this really meant that by September 2020, we had vaccines that were reasonably uh, valid. The minute you get the first FDA clearance for the first vice, uh, vaccine that was accepted, the bio and tech vaccine that was taken over by Pfizer, and then subsequently a few weeks later, the Moderna vaccine, both mRNA vaccines, you have the advanced economies rushing to buy up the available stocks. Within a month, again, this few small set of advanced country governments accounting for now 14% of the global population, within a month they had bought up 85% of the anticipated production 
for 2021. They just bought up all the available stocks. They did pre-orders, everything, okay? And uh, this obviously meant the rest of the world didn't get it. It wasn't supposed to be this way. You had a whole global facility that had been set up, COVAX, okay? It was under WHO, it was part of its uh, accelerator, ACT accelerator that was supposed to deal with the pandemic. And the whole deal was that COVAX would buy vaccines globally and distribute them globally according to population. So beginning with enough for everyone to vaccinate your frontline workers, you know, beginning with 3% of the population, the frontline workers and the extreme, you know, those under extremely vulnerable conditions, the elderly and all that, and the comorbidity, then to 20% of the population and then to everybody. Equitable distribution, that was the idea. What COVAX didn't do was to say, well, you can't do side deals. So all these countries that had supposedly signed up for COVAX not only did not deliver their promised money, I mean, COVAX, the estimation was it'll need about $26 billion, which let's face it is peanuts, right? We are talking about the Biden administration or the US spending trillions, five trillion so far, last count, yeah? 26 billion, really? I mean, you know, it's tiny for the global thing. The US didn't deliver on its promised payments. I mean, Trump never joined COVAX, Biden joined COVAX, but they still haven't delivered on even what, what eight billion that they were supposed to give. And uh, so they didn't pay in. They grabbed, that is the, the big pharma companies uh, were enticed into the side deals or even offered side deals at higher prices, opaque. We don't know what prices that they were finally paid for many of these. And so uh, COVAX was not able to get enough of the vaccines. Then, of course, it's not just that, it is that why was there such a limited supply? Because there were only a few companies making these vaccines. But why should only a few companies be making these vaccines? These are vaccines developed with public research and public support. So the mRNA vaccines, you know, the ones that most of you probably have, right? The Pfizer and Moderna, the big ones in the US and in most of the advanced economies. These 90% of that research was done in public labs in the United States, in the UK and by publicly paid professional workers, okay? Scientists and others in the labs. The last mile, that last nine to 10% that was required was funded by subsidies. So BioNTech gets, uh, I think it was uh, nearly 500 billion, 486 billion or something euros from the German government to do the research required. Moderna got more than two billion in the first round. I think finally it's got up to 10 billion from the US government. Covered entire R&D costs. It could not have, no way it could have cost more than that. And it used patents of the US, held by the US government. It, uh, the US helped it to get all the access to the patents it needed to do the work for. So it was entirely publicly funded. Yet it is handed over to Moderna and Pfizer to say, okay, now you run with it. You've got the patent, you produce. They were not forced to share technology with any other company. They were not told that you have to give compulsory licenses to other producers in other parts of the world or anywhere to expand production. No limit, no requirement at all. So you get this for free. Why would any government do this? Not for the benefit of their own people, surely. Not for the benefit of the rest of the world, surely, but for the benefit of the big pharma companies. So, you know, that nexus continues unabated. AstraZeneca. So how did that one happen? Because Oxford University had a lab which had developed this and entire, entirely public research, okay? It was public and charitable funding that enabled the development of that vaccine. And originally they had said, we are going to make this open access. We will put the entire stuff up on the website. We will tell everybody how to make it. We will share this technology because it's in the public good. The um, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, in which Bill Gates plays a major role. And the Gates Foundation is itself a major funder of Oxford University. I think they've given 400 million just for vaccine development. They persuaded Oxford University not to do that, but to go instead with AstraZeneca and said, we will make sure that AstraZeneca doesn't profit from it during the pandemic. Well, what we know happened is that AstraZeneca now holds the rights they did keep the prices a bit lower, but they did also prevent 
wider access. They did have compulsory license deals and sharing of technology with four other producers, but that was limited. It wasn't universal, it wasn't widespread, it was limited. And now they're saying, well, now we're gonna make profits. Now the pandemic's over, so we have to make profits. So you buy boosters, you buy it at three times the price. They were actually charging differential higher prices in the developing world than they were in Europe, okay? All this was not necessary. All of this could have been prevented very easily by public policies, okay? But not only did it happen, but there was, has been absolutely zero outcry in the developed world. I mean, frankly, to me, it's obscene that public health professionals in the United States are talking about giving the fourth vaccine, maybe the fifth booster to pe people in the United States, when only 14% of Africa has been vaccinated fully, and less than 20% has got even one dose, okay? So this is uh, an indication, this is slightly out of date, but the, unfortunately the picture hasn't changed much. Really what's happened is that the countries that are already dark have got darker because they've had even more doses. Yeah, there's a multiplication of the booster doses in the rich countries and giving it to two-year-olds and three-year-olds and maybe, I don't know, now they'll start giving it in the womb, I don't know. But you do, you do not get the distribution of the vaccines in Africa in particular, but in most of the rest of the world. And it's completely unnecessary. It really doesn't have to happen. The other aspect of this is something which I'm sure you would have heard a lot about because uh, Pavlina, I'm sure, will have been talking to you about it. The fact that, you know, informal workers obviously suffered much more during the pandemic. It's in the nature of informality, right? You, you don't have the kinds of basic protections, either legal or otherwise. You're not eligible for furloughs. You're not eligible for, uh, you know, any kind of sick leave. You're not, you don't get any of the basic things, minimum wages, you, uh, all the kinds of things you would need particularly, or even medical assistance, nothing during a pandemic, unless the government provides some basic protection for everybody, uh, health worker, I mean, nobody, right? Often you're not even recognized as workers. About half of self-employed workers in many countries, are, I mean, about half of informal workers in many countries are self-employed, which means you're responsible for your own protection. You can't even appeal to an employer. What did the pandemic do? It completely destroyed livelihoods. Quite apart from the medical implications, it really destroyed livelihoods, especially for informal workers and self-employed workers. But most of them live in countries where we didn't increase public spending. I already showed you that, right? I showed you how, what the massive differences were in terms of the fiscal spending. So globally, in the developed world, about 24% of workers are informal according to the ILO. In the developing world, or the not rich countries, it's 70% of workers are informal. And in some countries like India, 90% of our workers are informal. That is, they have no legal or social protection. And it turns out we were the ones who did the harshest lockdowns. We were the ones who imposed the most severe restrictions. So if you look at the right-hand side over there, uh, the kinds of, um, Informality is on the, the vertical axis, and the stringency of the government response is on the um, horizontal axis. So look at India, we're out there on top. We had the most stringent lockdown. It was imposed like a military curfew. People were beaten when they were seen on the streets. You know, it, it was just uh, beyond. You did that in a country where you have no social protection. <laughs> You have, uh, they're all informal workers. You're denying them their ability to survive and you're beating them if they dare to try and earn a living. And you have governments that are not increasing their spending in this period, okay? So the inequality that happened within the countries because of that wider fiscal inequality was even sharper than you might imagine. We now also have and so, um, you know, clearly, big, big in increases in insecurity, food insecurity and hunger, okay? So the FAO had already estimated, this is in the middle of the pandemic, that anywhere between 80 million to 132 million people were going to be undernourished because of the pandemic. This is in addition to the existing 850 million whom they said were undernourished globally, okay? 
the FAO definition, I should just also inform you, uh, has reduced the number of hunger, hungry people because they lowered the bar. This is a great way of meeting the SDGs. You know, you basically say, oh, you're not, you think you're hungry because you have only so many calories per day, but actually, no, we've lowered the bar, so you're not really hungry. Uh, you need less calories than you think. But what do we have since then? First of all, the pandemic itself created these supply shortages and so on, you know, food supply chains, delivery, local production. Remember, this is also a period where climate change is already happening, so there have been new pests, there have been different kinds of movements in climate that have affected agricultural production. But the main reason for hunger has been lack of money, lack of incomes. The livelihood collapse has been the fundamental reason why you have much more hungry populations now, globally. And it's not being helped by recent inflation. So, you know, for a large part of this whole pandemic period, food supply, uh, food prices didn't really increase very much. But what we've had from about a year ago is rising prices of both food and fuel, energy and uh, food grains in particular. And the Ukraine war has, of course, dramatically increased that. Uh, so this goes up, I think, only till February. We, we know that March, we've had very significant increases in food prices. Some of it is definitely due to the supply constraints created by the Ukraine war. But by the way, that's only part of it. A significant part is be that a lot of the food price increase and fuel price increase is being driven by speculation in the financial markets. Commodity futures markets are on song. They have been massively investing in these commodity futures. And it's because still the banks and the big financial institutions are able to access very, very cheap liquidity. And this is one of the places that they've chosen as a place to put their money. It's one of the easy ways to actually invest your money and get quick returns. You can always jump off before the before the inevitable downswing happens and, and leave the retail investors to face the flag. But that's one of the other big reasons why uh, commodity prices, fuel and food in, uh, food in particular, are going up. Again, people will say, oh, what can we do? That's the way the markets work. They don't have to work that way. It's government policies that have enabled this kind of speculation. It's the deregulation of financial markets the Dodd-Frank law in the US was supposed to stop that. It hasn't because the rules have been framed in such a lax way, thanks to the good old lobbying powers of commodity traders, that in fact those rules are, are meaningless. They're not preventing speculative activity in these essential markets, okay? It can be changed. Again, it, it will not change unless there is enough public mobilization and outcry to make it change, just like with vaccines. At the moment, there's zero public mobilization and outcry in the advanced companies where, countries where it matters. Similarly with food and fuel. But these directly impact developing countries. They add to the prices faced by ordinary people who, remember, are already battered by everything that has happened. But they also add to the fiscal problems of governments who have to face more, price, higher prices, and therefore are even less able to provide for the people. Okay, I want to just take up one further aspect. Um, have I gone? Oh, I'm talking for too long, but let me quickly talk about climate change because, again, you know, it's another aspect which is the, the inability to solve the climate problem is, I would argue, it's fundamentally due to inequality. Global inequality and within country inequality, okay? So how does this work? Well. The way we do it, you think we should be doing it globally because, hey, I mean, you know, the climate doesn't look for passports and visas. It's not being stopped at the border by anybody, right? So it's a global issue. We should be dealing with it globally. Unfortunately, it is still dealt with nationally. Every country makes commitments. And then you go to this international forum, the COP, yeah? Uh, COP 26 was last held in Glasgow in November 21. And you declare you're going to do some reductions based on your own responsibility. So we have all these climate negotiations. Every country gives their estimates. One big problem with the way the negotiations happen is that there is nothing recognizing what has been called the carbon debt or the climate debt. Okay, the fact that basically the rich countries are responsible for 
the historical carbon emission, which is why we have a problem today. And therefore, in a sense, they should at least be addressing some of that. There are all kinds of other I issues. Uh, they rely, I'm not gonna spend time on this, it's a complicated issue, but they use not the existing market exchange rates, but they use purchasing power parity exchange rates to give incomes of different countries. What that does is overstate the incomes of poor countries. So they are given a greater responsibility than they need to. Um, I, I'm happy to answer questions on that, but I'm just going to run through that. Then, of course, the measures are based on production. What are, how much carbon are you emitting within your own national borders? But supposing you're importing a lot of that, supposing you're passing off all that carbon emitting production to China and India and elsewhere, then it should be consumption based, right, rather than production based. That's not how it is done at COP. It is all production based. And so everybody then points fingers at China and India. China is now the largest emitter. Emitter, everyone says, shame on you, shocking, you're just terrible, how dare you? And then India says, we won't reduce coal. And they say, oh my God, look at India, they're driving us all into climate extinction, etc." But if you look at the debt part, today's developed countries, remember 14% of global population are responsible for 80% of the global cumulative carbon emissions for more than one and a half centuries. Now you could say, well, okay, but nobody knew that carbon emission was a problem for at least, you know, I mean, why pick on us? Because we were doing this when nobody knew it was an issue. It turns out that more than half of these emissions were done in the last 30 years when everybody knew there was a problem. And when you had technologies to reduce it, when you could have done mitigation much more. So it's not the case that you know this is something so far in the past that you can ignore. That carbon debt is relatively recent and it continues, okay? These 14% of the world population will continue to emit much more. It's built into their own zero carbon pledges. It's built in that they will continue to dominate and account for about 60% of global emissions until 2050. If you look at the per capita emissions, you realize why it's a bit unfair to blame India. Okay, so per capita emissions, the United States is out there, but of course there are also other countries like Saudi Arabia, which is an oil producer, and uh, Australia, which is a big mining producer and all, which have high per capita emissions based on production. But you know, everyone's yelling at China and India, look, it's small, even China, it's really uh, less than, I mean, it's about half of the US in terms of per capita production emissions, okay? If you look at emissions based on final demand, that is how much you're importing, you're, you're exporting the emissions to some other country, but your own consumption and investment remains quite carbon intensive, then the US is so far ahead of the pack compared to everyone else, okay? And then, in fact, China looks much, much less, but even, countries like India, I mean, it's only then 1.5 metric tons per capita. Really, really very small, okay? So this whole how dare you kind of thing, it, it's not just hypocritical, it's completely false, it's unjust. But, and this is important, oh dear, can you even read these numbers? They're so small, I'm sorry. Okay, so one of the very interesting things, this comes out of the World Inequality Report, it's based on work done by Luca Chancel, and it's, it's really very interesting and important, showing how much inequality there is in carbon emissions even within countries. So what's really striking is that the poorest half of even the rich countries doesn't emit that much, it's not so bad. So the poorest half of Europe, for example, 5.1 metric tons per capita, compared to the top 10% of South and Southeast Asia, it's about half, it's less than half of what the richest 10% are emitting in South and Southeast Asia, okay? The poorest half of North America even, which is like the biggest emitter you've seen, right? They are also less than the richest 10%, and again, they are significantly, they're like one third of what the East Asian top 10% are emitting. So there's a lot of inequality within countries. Basically, there's an Oxfam report, which is even more striking, that says the top 10% of the world are responsible for 80% of global emissions. And that top 10% is resident all over the world, mostly, of course, your Elon Musks and others, but the ones who are really lauded because they're green, 
they're producing a green electric vehicle, but who are really massive emitters, but also in the rest of the world. Yet all of the strategies that we look at, these are all focused on the poor. They all punish the poor. So what do we think of? We think of a border carbon tax. What does that do? It raises the prices that impact the poor, and it reduces the possibility of export for developing countries which are already facing massive employment and livelihood crisis, okay? So here's the Oxfam report. The richest 1% is more than 100 times the poorest half of the global population, okay? 100 times. If you could just focus on that top 1%, if you said, we're going to tax you, we're going to prevent you doing certain things, we're going to regulate the hell out of you, you could just do the re reduce the annual carbon emissions by over a third. You could go so far to meeting climate goals if you just focused on the rich in every economy. You don't have to attack the poor. But currently, all of the policies that are advocated impact the poor differentially and they don't address the excess consumption of the rich. And again, it's not necessary. It's something we let our governments get away with. So it's a, it's a false dichotomy to say, you know, you can either choose development or you get poverty and you get, you know, you can either choose climate mitigation with lots of poverty or you can choose development and more carbon emission. That's false. You can do it with greener technologies. You can improve the energy efficiency, you can change patterns of investment and consumption. You can, within energy, go from the bad stuff, coal and petroleum and so on, to the better stuff, the green and, new and renewables and so on. You could change urbanization patterns. All of this requires investment and it requires technology. Okay, but you can do it. There's an estimate by Ch uh, Chomsky and Polin in a book they have a couple of years ago which says you can uh, actually do this with 2.5% of GDP globally spent every year, which is not that much, right? I mean, as I said, advanced countries, out of, a, out of the hat, they generated 28% of GDP, katak, right? So you can do it if you want. Uh, the, the critical thing is to make them want, but it's not just the finance, it's also the access to technology. Currently, we have an intellectual property regime that actively prevents developing countries either from getting access to the latest technologies or even trying to develop their own. When they give subsidies to develop their own technologies, they face cases in the WTO brought by the US. So really, we have to fix these. None of this is necessary. All of this can be changed. These are all part of regulatory structures that are rigged in favor of big capital. And it's part of the prey taking over so much that now they're not going to just destroy, the, sorry, the predators taking over so much that they're not just going to destroy the prey, they're going to destroy the planet, right? And we let them. I mean, I think that's the critical thing. So what do we find? We find that basically I would call it a form of neocolonialism, what we're getting. The global macroeconomic, health, climate strategies, they're all deeply colonial, okay? How do we revive then a progressive multilateralism? Because we obviously have to get rid of all this unjust stuff, which is counterproductive. But we're stuck with this architecture, yeah? We can't simply say the hell with all of that and we'll begin anew, because we have all of these existing frameworks. We have to somehow change those. Can we do it with unilateral action? Unlikely. But maybe we can do it with regional responses. The African Union now, it's investing more in developing its own technology hubs because it's realized that it, there's no point relying on the rest of the world for the vaccines. You've got to develop your own. Um, the WHO is assisting it, but guess what? They're facing cases in the WTO brought by Moderna. How dare you use technology that we have used, mRNA technology. But, and that also let's not get away from the fact of geopolitical tensions. I mean, yes, there's a war in Europe for sure, but there are incipient and major geopolitical tensions in much of the rest of the world. And then, of course, there's the domestic inequality, which we already saw in the carbon inequality, and it's growing, okay? We have, in India, one of the fastest growing inequality of both income and assets in the world, but pretty much in, in many countries. And this is intertwined with all of these now authoritarian kinds of elites, crony capital that encourages more authoritarianism, governments that are able to use this 360-degree surveillance technologies to further reinforce their power, 
On the other hand, it, it seems hopeless, but you know, it's an urgent situation. We can't simply say, can't do anything. You've got to do something. Yeah, it's, it's too urgent to say, oh, it's a big problem. We'll go back and come back next week to think about it. You have to actually try and do something right now. So if we are going to do something, we actually have to create much more public demand for doing things like making a broad-based global recovery. It has to put public spending has to be there and it has to put money in the hands of those who will spend it, not the rich, not in the form of tax cuts to the rich and to large capital, but direct incomes to those who will spend it, especially uh, not just for, for welfare and equity, but for macroeconomic reasons. That's how you will get a sustainable recovery. And obviously, employment revival is crucial. I think you all know enough about public employment schemes, so I, I'm not going to talk about that, but they are an essential part of that recovery package. But you also need special packages for what are called the MSMEs, the micro, small, and medium enterprises, which have to be encouraged to grow and expand based on good quality jobs. I've talked about food security, which also means that you have to address the cultivation crisis, the fact that agriculturalists now find it very hard to be viable, the fact of dealing with climate threats for both adaptation and mitigation. And in all of this, the care sectors are absolutely crucial, okay? Care investment is critical for future strategy. And it's both a necessity and an opportunity. You would have thought the pandemic would show governments how essential it is, but turns out it wasn't good enough. You needed, I don't know what you need to make government see this, but, but what's interesting is that, you know, care, unlike a lot of other activities, it's relational. So technology can never replace it. You, will, you, you can have technology assist you, but you can never do without the caregiver. If you promote a lot more positive investment in care, you get much more positive in employment effects. And it's also inevitably employment intensive. So there are many advantages in a world where people are fearing that the fourth industrial revolution will remove the capacity for job generation, okay? Also, you know, demography means you're going to need more care. Whether you're a young society or an aging society, you're going to need much more. We are under providing care because we are hoping markets will deliver. They don't. We have to do it through public intervention. So basically, what am I saying? We need a, a, need, a new deal, and we, we need it to be global, OK? But so what's the new deal? Well, if you remember the famous Roosevelt New Deal, I, I'm told you're near the Roosevelt Library, right? So yeah, the Roosevelt New Deal, it was based on recovery, based on massively increased public spending, OK? Also, regulation and redistribution. These were the three pillars of that New Deal. And I'm saying all three are required. But it's not just enough to be green. I know green is the one that everybody talks about, the Green New Deal and so on. I'm saying it has to be multicolored, okay? Green, yes. Blue, I haven't really talked about it, but water is such a big issue. I really think the wars of this century, certainly the second half of this century, are more likely to be about water than oil, okay? The, it's, it's absolutely critical what is happening. And, and you probably know that, right? Any of you from the western part of the US will be aware of the impacts of droughts and, and so on. So it has to be green and blue, recognizing all the different climate and environment challenges. It has to be purple. That is the emphasis on the care economy. Purple is seen as the color of, of care work and the care economy in general. And it has to be red. It has to redistribute in assets, in incomes, in opportunities, in food, in essential public services, in employment. And it has to be reduced, these inequalities have to be reduced, not just by class, but by gender, by age, by social category, race, ethnicity, you name it, okay? And it has to be global. What does that mean? It means you have to have the appropriate international architecture, which means controlling finance, con limiting these intellectual property rights, uh, uh, tax cooperation. It's such low-hanging fruit. There is so much capacity to tax rich individuals and multinational corporations that we're simply not taking advantage of. They're paying much less tax, lower rates than all of us, okay? Debt relief for countries that are unable to actually function because of all this big overhang of sovereign debt, expanding special drawing rights of the IMF, putting a peace clause in the WTO, stop having these incredibly unjust and ridiculous cases that prevent good stuff from happening and much, much more financial regulation. 
and I'm sorry to have gone on for so long, but let me stop here. <laughs> Yes, of course, yes, yes. So shall I just keep standing here? Is that all right for all of you? Yeah? Okay. No question, that's a bit depressing. Oh yeah, <laughs> go ahead, yes, please. These are really excellent questions, both of them, okay? So the inflation thing is a very big discussion right now, and it really depends on the context you're in. So the United States, for example, is a very different context from inflation in India or Brazil, where we have, so you would have to have different kinds of policy response. Uh, so let's begin with what you should not do. You should not do, uh, you shouldn't be using a hammer to, uh, you know, get rid of, or to deal with the, something which is much more complex because you will just end up destroying the, the, the overall thing. The hammer in this case is just raising interest rates and tightening monetary policy. That is, um, it doesn't recognize the specific character of this inflation. And I would argue that this inflation is driven by three things. It's driven by certain supply constraints, which are changing. Somet sometimes they're the supply chain issues that come out of the pandemic and post-pandemic. Sometimes they're the Ukraine type or wartime supply chain issues. Uh, for that, you need strategies that reduce those constraints, the bottlenecks, okay? So it could be public spending directed towards reducing those bottlenecks in different areas, okay? Uh, that's the number one. The number two is that there is significant um, increase in financial activity that is causing certain prices to rise, okay? Speculative activity. Uh, which is absolutely the case for food and fuel. I've, I've already mentioned it. There is, we can see that there's huge increased activity in the commodity futures market, and we are getting uh, futures prices being higher than spot prices, which is a typical case of you know, speculation feeding the, the current spot prices. And so you bring in regulations to prevent that. Okay? And third is price gouging. Let's not kid ourselves. Companies are taking advantage of this and declaring shortages and etc. This is an, I would say, a very evident case for certain types of price regulation and controls. My young colleague in the UMass, she wrote an article in The Guardian, Isabella Weber, on how price controls should be something considered. And of course, she was banned and pilloried and everybody got after her, including Paul Krugman and others, saying this is so stupid. Uh, it's interesting because Krugman himself had argued for price controls earlier, but you know, the US is full of price controls. Uh, fuel, the price, the consumer price of fuel is hugely controlled in the US. And in fact, right now, Biden has just released strategic reserves designed to lower the price of fuel. Again, uh, rent controls are price controls. There's a whole range of different price controls. What we do know is that whether it is certain drugs or it is certain other commodities, companies take advantage of these situations of flux to engage in profiteering. And therefore, there is a strong case for price controls in those specific sectors, okay? Um, I would say that's the combination for the US. For countries like India, Brazil, it's a whole different ball game. Because first of all, we have currency depreciation, right? We're already getting capital flight because they've announced, the US Fed has announced that they're going to be cutting you know, raising interest rates. So we're already getting capital flight. Our currencies are already depreciating. That generates inflation. We import uh, fuel, we import fertilizers, and we import some food, all of which the global prices are rising. So these are cost push elements that are hard for us to control, okay? For that, we will need to think of specific measures to generate more supplies 
domestically. And again, they can be done. It will mean a certain time period. You know, but again, an interest rate response is the wrong response because this is not a demand-led inflation. This is a cost-push inflation. So everywhere, the whole idea is the minute you have inflation, you, you have to immediately have a rise in the interest rate. That's absolutely not the way to go. You have to look at the specific case of that country. What are the elements of that inflation? And then do policies to address that inflation. Okay. Your second question, what do countries that do not have a global reserve currency do? And boy, I can tell you this is what is exercising the minds of developing country or you know, governments in the rest of the world hugely because they have been stuck in this now for quite a long time. One of the reasons, I think I already outlined, one of the reasons why it's so difficult for them is because they have these open capital market accounts. Capital can whoosh in and whoosh out, and most of the time it has nothing to do with you. You know, it has to do with the fact that the Fed has made interest rates near zero for, uh, I don't know, 15 years now. And so there's all this money sloshing about that is looking for places to go, and then they can move out again like that. And they do, right, whenever they feel like. So it gives you massive volatility. Again, you don't need to live with this. What's the idea of having an open capital account that you will attract capital so you can have more investment? Well, it turns out all these countries that have opened their capital account, we haven't had more investment. In South and Southeast Asia, investment rates have been falling for the last 15 years. Why the hell, excuse my language, why on earth are we keeping the open capital accounts? What do they give us except volatility? If you don't have the open capital accounts, if you bring in regulations that will limit the kind of capital that comes, Taiwan does it, for example. That you're only going for certain kinds of productive capital and so on. China does it. If we do that, we have much more freedom of our domestic fiscal capacity. So I would say one important thing you have to do to get back your fiscal space is to cut back on the things that force you, and of course, the minute you do that, everyone will turn around and say, oh, this is terrible, now that country is doomed, etc., which is nonsense. Especially if enough countries do it, you have much more possibilities of doing, charting your own path, if you like. Yeah, go ahead. Again, this is such a good question, right? Because uh, here's the funny thing. We have an international framework, a multilateral framework, which currently doesn't have any power at all, right? And that's a problem because you need to do things globally, as I've said. And so it, it's a framework that exists, but it's, it's really like a house that's been built and no one's occupying it because or else every now and then a bully occupies it and does what they like with it rather than it being genuinely a global thing. And so there is a real problem. I mean, and I, let's not kid ourselves, it's a serious problem because global power imbalances persist and they're not gonna go away just because we would like them to. It's also true though, if we do persist in this, that we are heading for mutually assured destruction, right? I mean, no two ways about it. We are heading for, I don't know, climate change of excess of two, three percent in, in certainly your lifetime which will have consequences that we can't even begin to contemplate, oh, and all kinds of other things. I mean, extreme uh, dystopia in terms of human and social relations and so on. So I suppose the whole question is, can you imagine that mankind would, or human humanity would step back from that brink? You know, and uh, let me say, I, I think it would. Uh, okay, maybe I'm wrong. But I think it would, especially because the framework exists, right? Now, what does that framework mean in terms of the legal 
constructions. And I think that's such an important part of it. Because, you know, what we have realized, what I've now realized rather late in my life, is that economics, ultimately, it's all about law. Yeah? And there's a wonderful book by Katerina Pistor. I don't know if you have read it. It's called The Code of Capital. And it's, it's really about, from its origins, capital, capitalism is ultimately about the legal codes that have enabled it. And she's talking about how these have evolved over time and how they're playing out today in all kinds of different ways. So internationally right now we have a legal system or a, a legal architecture that prevents us from doing good stuff. Prevents all of the things that I've been talking about, right? I mean, you try and do technology transfer, you've got trips to prevent you. You try and get climate finance, you've got the financial markets, and so on. These are all constructs of human beings, which means they can also be undone by human beings, yeah? But we have a tendency, once it's done, to think, oh my God, this is written in stone, this is inevitable. Uh, all my students have grown up in a world of trips. They cannot imagine an intellectual property regime other than trips. Yet it's so recent. Until the mid-90s, 85% of all patents in the US, the home of patents, were held by public institutions, right? It, this is all really recent. And so somehow we persuaded ourselves that this cannot be any other way. It can indeed, it just ha it, but it does require much more concerted mobilization yeah? and much more awareness that which are these constraints, which are the legal codes and constraints that are st stopping us from doing things. And then of course, finally, what you said, that, that the problem is though the power imbalances because let's face it, the empire will strike back, right? And they're not going to give up big capital, la very rich individuals, etc. cetera, are not going to give up these positions uh, of power and ability to garner the global surplus without a fight. And they are able to fight because now they are assisted by governments who are much more openly in bed with them, if you like, and technologies that they can use to make everybody think in different ways. So yeah, it's a tougher call. Is it an impossible call? I don't think so, because you know, it, that's the funny thing about technology, the things that you can do this way, you can also do it the other way, yeah? I, I, was, um, I was telling Paulina last night that uh, I had a teacher, when I was a student at Cambridge, I had a teacher, a very famous economist called Joan Robinson, who used to visit India a lot, and she had this favorite saying. She said, everything you can say about India, the opposite is also true. So let's extend that to the world. Everything you can say about the world, and I've said pretty depressing things, everything you can say about it, the opposite is also true. You can also find you know, the pushback, you can also find the democratic urge, you can also find the demands uh, in different places, in different parts, and sometimes they're just the thin end of the wedge, sometimes they're different isolated things, but they all add up and they can make a difference. So I would say it's a tough call, there's no question about it. Uh, but it can be done. It needs much more wider public awareness and mobilization. But you know, even that can happen. It's not impossible. And it's happened in the past. Yeah, go ahead. What are some of the? Well, first of all, I would insist that the current TRIPS regime, which requires, first of all, it has a very low bar on what is a patent or what, I, what things you could demand monopoly control over, okay? Whether it's industrial design, it's at the very, very low bar. You change that back to the earlier uh, s systems which prevailed in many countries with a much higher bar you reduce the length of the patent. It's currently 15 years is required of every country. In some countries it can go up to 30, 40 years. You reduce that to five to seven years. You demand much greater freedom of compulsory licensing, the kind of freedom that exists in TRIPS, but it's never been allowed to be implemented because they bring all these cases each time. So you expand the possibility of compulsory licensing. You bring in the possibility of TRIPS waivers whenever there are emergencies. Right? So there was a demand for TRIPS waiver, there still is in the WTO, brought by India, South Africa, and 156 developing countries. All asked for a waiver for the pandemic, for all COVID-related drugs, therapeutics, diagnostics, etc. Okay, 
resisted by mainly Europe. Do the TRIPS waiver for those global emergencies. Do it for things like climate change, which is a global emergency. Yeah? Uh, so these are some of the specifics. I mean, we could go in detail. There are many things in TRIPS that would require change. Uh, but essentially, they are all easily done because all of these, they were literally brought in just you know, in the 1990s. Yeah? Uh, during the Uruguay round. There is a wonderful book, for those of you who are interested in this, by Susan Sell. She's a law professor. And uh, I forget what it's called. It's a, but it's an open access book. You can download it. Susan Sell. She has a wonderful book on how trips happened. And it was really these 12 men. Huh? 12 men coming from the big CEOs of pharma, IT, and uh, finance. These four guys met on the sidelines one day in Davos and said, we really should do something to make intellectual property an essential part of these ne GATT negotiations. And then the whole story of how they managed it and succeeded it. So if they could do it, I mean, surely the more of us, for God's sake, maybe we can also do, do something in the opposite direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.